Welcome to the Macroevolution Lecture Series. Now, if we've been following along, we've learned about the evolutionary theory and what is evolution and how it works. We talked about the idea that life tends to reproduce very quickly and grow exponentially over time if allowed to with unlimited resources, but that the universe has limited energy and the Earth receives a limited amount of energy and ecosystems usually have limited resources, which means life forms which are different from each other because of variations introduced by mutations will be different from each other and therefore will have to compete for these resources. And because they are different, they are one is going to be better than the other than surviving. So these differences within and between species will cause what we call natural selection, where the one which is the fittest or has the best set of adaptations will survive longer to have more reproductive encounters and to have more offspring that survives to do the same. So the species with the greater reproductive ability will become more common in the population and so will be the genes of that kind. And that because of that, over many generations or even abruptly because of random events like genetic drift, gene flow, uh, mutations, non-random mating, and natural selection, the population changes over time. And that is microevolution, which we talked about already. Then is, there's macroevolution. If this process continues over long periods of time, or even abruptly, changes will accumulate to a point where two different populations will be incapable of reproducing anymore. And at that point, we may call them two different species. And that is what we have to talk about in this lecture series. Now, it is controversial uh, to actually accept evolution for many people, but it's not accepting it. It will be ignorant to the fact and the data that we have already discussed extensively throughout the, the lecture series that we talked about. We talked about all the evidence that exists for evolutionary uh, theory. We also talk about the microevolution and how it has been observed over and over again. Now we're going to be talking about speciation, which is macroevolution. Now, for many people, this is where they draw the line. They will say, yes, I understand that life can change. Yes, I understand that changes will occur within a population, but no one has ever seen a population evolve into a different kind of population or one species evolve into a new species. That is not true. Scientists have observed both micro and macro evolution. And at the genetic level, they are the same. And we'll talk more about that later in the lecture series. But before we do that, let's get started by talking about some of the things we need to understand before we start talking about macroevolution. We are, of course, going to talk about species. So it's very important to define that concept of species. We need to understand what is a species. A species is one kind of life. Now, the problem with the word kind is that sometimes people see it and apply it whatever way they want. Uh, someone who is against evolution will say there's never been any observed changes in kind of life. Well, if you don't define kind, you can't really argue if that's actually happened or not. Because we will say, well, of course, we have seen species evolve into other different species. And then at that point, the person can change. No, by kind, I mean a new genus. Well, and then we come up with an example of a genus evolving to a different genus, and then somebody says, no, 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 but I mean the family, or the order, or the class, or the phylum, and so forth. At what point will that stop? It won't, because it would be impossible for you to determine what a kind is if you keep changing it to fit the need of the data. So we need to start with defining what the species is so it is clear what we mean by speciation or macroevolution or a change in the species. Now, in, we've taught this about several times. We did this in evolutionary theory. We did this in macroevolution. And we're doing we did it in taxonomy. And we're doing it again now. The idea of species in biology is, is what we call the ecological species test or the biological species test. The idea is that members of the same species have the ability to to actually have sex with each other and create an organism that continue to do the same. In other words, a population that can interbreed with another population means that they're both the same species. That's what we'll call the, the breeding test. There's also You can also look at morphology or morphological differences that exist between members of different populations. And you can also look at the niche, which is the role that the, these organisms fulfill in their environment. You can also look 
at molecular or biochemical differences that exist at the genome sequence or the protein sequences between the animals and if there's enough DNA differences it may be considered different species and that's an important one because sometimes species cannot interbreed if they're asexually reproducing therefore you're gonna need something more like a morphological test or a niche test or a molecular biological test all of these are important concepts that we need to understand but remember one of the major ways to define a species is that this population has the ability to interbreed. And this is a concept that's going to be very important as we continue this lecture series. Also very important is going to be the concept of molecular differences, or differences that accumulate over long periods of time, or the differences in morphology, or differences in roles. All of these concepts will come back. So remember how we define a species. Remember also the idea of natural selection, which is the process by that which drives evolution. Remember we talked about in the last chapter, there are many things which can actually cause microevolution. One of the major causes of changes across generation is natural selection, which I described in the beginning of this video when I talked about the fact that the organisms which have the best set of adaptations for their environment will survive longer, have more children which survive to do the same, and therefore become more common of the populations over time. And this is, of course, something that happens because of the type of pressure that exists in the environment. So if you change the environment, you change the pressure, you change the way the natural selection actually works. Attached to this lecture series is a video that talks about how evolution actually works. You can actually watch that video if you want to see a simulation of natural action taking place to understand how it actually progresses over time. And you see that it all depends on the pressure of the environment. Another important concept in evolution is going to be the idea of genetics. Remember that genetics has everything to do with evolution because microevolution is changes in genes and macroevolution is going to be happening when enough changes occur in the genes where the populations will no longer be able to cross with each other. So all the things we learn in inheritance, all the things we learn since Mendel and are combined with the things we learn from Darwin in his evolutionary theory in the modern synthesis theory of evolution which tries to explain the idea of how evolution depends on the changes that occur genetically. Two scientists called S. Wright and A. Fisher were the first ones to talk about how this variety and, and changes across generations have everything to do with uh, a combination of the effects of genetics and evolution. We also talk about the fact that evolution can happen abruptly, very quickly, and then stay kind of constant over long periods of time in what we call punctuated equilibrium model, or that it can happen gradually over time in the change that we call gradualism evolution. But e either it constitutes examples of species changing over time, and therefore our evolution. By the way, remember that punctuated equilibrium and gradualism are actually two ways which mimic, mimic basically a whole concept. Sometimes it happens one way, sometimes it happens the other. Evolution is actually a combination of both. Hence the idea of mother's synthesis theory of putting these two things together. Also remember that evolution is not going to happen unless there's variation already and that the source of variation is going to be mutations. Now, while sexual reproduction will shuffle around the genes and cause new looks to combine in the population and genes to um, uh, cause new combinations of looks, evolution won't happen unless new looks evolve. So you can't just recombine looks. In other words, get some of this and put with some of that and or shuffle those looks around. You also need new looks to exist in order for you to actually have evolution. Those new looks will happen because of mutations, which are changes in the structure of the chromosome or in the sequence of the DNA code, leading to phenotypical changes because the DNA is, of course, the genotype that determines the phenotype, which is the proteins. We learn about that with the protein synthesis. If you change these genes enough, you're going to change the look, and that's causing the variation that you see in life and all the deleterious things and all the adaptations that, that are basic for the natural selection process. Now, a lot of people will actually argue that mutations are impossible. They're, they're not going to create new information, that it is impossible to create new data in life and that all mutations will cause problems for animals and lead them to die instead of helping them out. 
that no new information could ever evolve through evolution and that in fact all the variety that you see in life is a result of reshuffling of genes through sexual selection. That is of course a wrong statement if you consider the fact that asexually producing organisms will still change over time. So you do, first of all, you do not need sexual selection to reshuffle the genes. Second, it is, there's evidence of new genes arising through processes like molecular clocking that we understand now that the genome is fluid and constantly changing because of both chromosomal and gene mutations. Therefore, evolution does create new genes. And sometimes, even though it is rare, those genes will cause changes in the genotype, which will cause changes in the phenotype. Although most of the changes are what we call neutral mutations which are very, very quickly, since they're not susceptible to left natural selection. Some changes will occur in crucial or more important genes. And yes, the majority of the time, those will be deleterious changes, which will lead to problems for the animal. But sometimes, they will be beneficial. And you could ask, how could that ever be if there's so few of those changes could ever be beneficial? How could it have so many variety exist if the majority of mutations are negative? Well, with enough trials, anything is possible. If you're going to go to the and run the lotto a few million times, your chances of winning are pretty considerable. And that's what exactly what life is about. There is so much life on Earth and so many examples of each kind of life form, so many members of each population, that evolution can happen quite quickly in a matter of a few million years. And I see some heads scratching saying that's not so quick. Well, it is pretty quick if you consider the extents of the evolution time of history of the universe at billions of years. And that's why enough trials have occurred. An explosion of life is allows for this enough trials so that one in a million, if need be, are positive mutations, then these mutations could cause variation within a population that over many generations could change the life form substantially and cause what we call evolution. Remember that this can be tracked across the record genetically, not through things like we call paralogous and orthologous genes, which will indicate speciation events as well as changes within a population that leads to variation. We view that concept in the taxonomy lecture series. Paralogous genes are genes which are changed from the original. And orthologous genes are duplication events which add two of the same gene in the code and then one of the genes can change. And then you have two types of genes within the same genome uh, rather than a, a gene change from a, an ancient genome, which would be paralogous genes. Either way, by looking at similarities that exist within the genome, scientists can make an assertion of that of connections that exist between life forms. And we talked about this in the taxonomy lecture series. We can look at both morphological similarities and differences, and also molecular similarities and differences to, as records of the evolutionary process. The similarities indicate common ancestry or common pressure, and we call those homologous or analogous structures. Sometimes you also have vestigial structures, which is evidence of non-functional pieces of morphology or DNA, which are left over from previous steps of, gen of evolutionary processes, and which are now being selected against uh, if they're causing disadvantages. And if not, they remain there as indications of where it used to be. There's also uh, mosaic structures, which are structures that evolve for one purpose, but then are changed for a different purpose, and which explain a lot of the complexity of life, because sometimes life does not need to create things from scratch. It will just change something that's already there. And that makes a lot more sense than trying to understand something coming out of nowhere and evolving all at once. We will talk all about all of these things when we talk about the origin of life on the next video lecture series. But I wanted to review some of these major concepts. There's also the mechanisms of microevolution. That's the last thing we have to review. Remember, macroevolution will happen if any of these five things takes place. If you have mating, which is non-random, and that's usually what happens in nature because animals will live close to other certain kinds of animals, and there's also selection. 
which is in itself another one of the mechanisms, and a very important one that changes the populations across generations. There's also migrations, which bring and take genes across populations. You also have mutations, which add new genomes and new alleles to the population. And you also have genetic drift, which are random changes in the DNA code because of random events in the environment, such as the bottleneck effect and the grandfather effect and the founder effect. Together, these mechanisms of microevolution will change the genetic composition of a population. And when enough changes take place, it is possible for macroevolution to take place. And we'll talk about that on this lecture series. I'll see you guys then.